of this computer. Excellent. Yeah. So um, I hope you all get something out of this. Um, I, um, I'll go through the presentation. Now, my Zoom um, account only allows me to um, go 40 minutes before it cuts me off. Um, so if we run out of time, I'll just schedule another one right after this one and um, and email that out right away to everybody. Um, but hopefully that won't happen, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so the first thing I got to do is share my screen. And hopefully you can see my screen with a bunch of stuff on it. Yes. Yep. And um, so here's here's the Milky Way. Um, this is probably my favorite picture. This is actually a composite. Um, I don't know why I got it through my head to uh, um, do a composite with the Milky Way, but I saw some other people that had some uh, composites, and I thought, that might be fun. So I took a picture of the Naples Bridge way before the hurricanes and um, then uh, replaced the sky with, with, with the Milky Way, just in case anybody was curious about that. Um, so I'll, I'll start out by saying I'm not the world's best expert on Milky Way photography. Um, I started doing this in um, about three, four years ago. And I took a uh, online class. It was a three three different days um, from a lady. Um, her name was uh, Christine Richard, and she also goes by Christine Rose. And um, she has a, um, typically once a year she offers a three day Facebook class on um, she calls it your first picture of the Milky Way or something like that. And um, I found it very, very um, interesting. And it sounded um, um, really, really nice to uh, do that. And Virginia and I were talking uh, just a little bit ago um, how easy it is once you start getting into it and you, you uh, start taking the pictures. So um, how I started was I took pictures of the moon and then sat through the free webinar, uh, took some pictures from my driveway, um, looked up true dark areas near me and found that the Big Cypress National Preserve um, at night was a, a true dark area. And depends where you are in the preserve. Um, it's either a, um, um, a Bortle 2, and I'll talk about Bortle in a little bit, or a Bortle 3 if you get closer to the uh, roads with the lights or there's some houses in, in the preserve too um, that have uh, lights that uh, could interfere. And then I sat through Christine's webinar again to see what I missed and I did miss some stuff. So I, um, I'm glad I sat through it again. And then I went to Big Cypress uh, a couple more times or a few more times. And um, so I'll talk about that as we get into this. And if anybody has any comments or anything to add, or, Wes, I, have, I have a question. This is Gretchen. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember when her um, webinar became available and I just was too busy and I didn't get into it. But now I went to her site and it's not being offered. Is that something you downloaded and can share with us? Or do we just need to wait till she re reoffers that the fresh web, the free web webinar next year? Yeah, um, you, you might want to do both. Um, I do have um, the presentations she gave. Um, I don't know which um, session it was. Um, I, I think I actually took the session three different times, but I, I will email everybody a copy of those. I may have to do it um, in um, three different emails if it's too big to put all in one, but I'll send you all three of those presentations and, and uh, you can look through those. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, you, even if you look through them, it's uh, always good because she interjects so much other information as she's going through that it's um, very insightful, really. Great. Thanks. You. Thank you. Sure. Um, so this is the stuff that, that, that I've used, um, except for the last thing on the bottom. 
It is a, a camera capable of longer exposure. My daughter uses her cell phone and um, she uh, actually uh, goes into her backyard and lays it on the ground and takes pictures. And it, her cell phone um, is always the latest technology available. So it's uh, um, the, the pictures are really good. Um, I use my uh, regular um, camera for that, for this instead of my cell phone. Um, a wide angle lens is good. Um, I think most people try to use like a 28 or a 35, or if they're trying to get a bigger picture of the sky, maybe a, a 14 or an 18 or something like that millimeter. Um, a sturdy tripod, I found that to be um, pretty essential. And a small flashlight or a headlamp. And if you have one that uh, um, turns red, and I got to try to find my red head, headlamp, uh, that's really good because it doesn't destroy your night vision. Um, a shutter release of some sort, either a remote or, or a tethered one. Um, and if you, it takes batteries, bring extra batteries with you, extra camera batteries. And the reason why I say extra batteries on both of those is when you go out, um, especially if you're going out to a remote site, and your batteries die on you. You don't want to waste that that whole trip. Um, lens cleaner because um, you, you generally have your camera pointed up, um, so if it's dusty or 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 anything, you can get uh, a lot of dirt on your your uh, front of your lens. A star app. Um, there's a app called Skyview Light or um, Stellarium. And um, I've got both of those, but I'll kind of show you, I don't know how well this will uh, show, um, but um, yeah, the Milky Way isn't up high enough, but um, I don't know if you can see. We just see your presentation. Oh, you don't see my picture, okay. Um, I guess I can't show it to you, but um, both of these have free versions. Um, and that just helps you locate um, where where in the sky that that you want to um, what you want to um, take a photo of. And, and generally, um, in in southern Florida, um, the um, Milky Way is going to appear um, more towards the south, um, and um, it uh, kind of travels from um, east to west um, through the night, but uh, um, the um, also through the, the, the season. But all you have to do is uh, point the your your cell phone at at the sky and if the Milky Way is out, it'll it'll pop up and, and you'll be able to see that. And I think in Christine's um, presentation and one of them, I think she talks about how to, how to locate it without the applications, but the applications make it a lot easier. And uh, bug repellent um, is, is always good um, at night time too. Um, now, I don't have a star tracker myself, but uh, in the on the slide, the uh, um, this bottom picture, that's a star tracker. And um, what uh, that uh, um, does for you is, it'll move the camera automatically and kind of track the sky. And that way you don't get star trails. And a star trail, instead of a dot, um, it gives you a streak um, for, for all the stars. And some people like that. Um, those are nice shots too, I think. Um, but uh, if you're really trying to get the, the Milky Way, um, sometimes that's distracting in, in pictures. Um, so I, I threw this thing in. Um, if you ask five photographers how they do the Milky Way um, or any astrophotography, you're probably going to get five different answers. Um, and I've done that. I, I've talked to a number of people, and everybody has their their preferences, their opinions uh, on everything. So what we're going to go through is kind of my view of it. I know other people have other views. And uh, if, if any of you have a, a different view too, while we're going through this stuff, um, feel free to speak up and, and, and share.
I think the most controversial of all the things in Milky Way photography might be the um, focal point. And a lot of people um, depend on using the depth of field to um, to cover their, their focal point. But, um, and, and, and that's okay. Um, but um, I am a firm believer in, um, in uh, um, optics and there's there's one focal point um, th that uh, um, everything comes into focus, um, meaning that if I focus on five feet, that's going to be in focus. And then you can use your aperture to get a greater or lesser depth of field. So I'm going to talk about three philosophies that that I've talked to other photographers about, and. Um, and uh, talk maybe about some of the advantages and disadvantages. The first one is the one that I learned from Christine um, is focus on infinity and back off just a bit. Um, and the second one is focus on a bright star um, and like zoom in, focus on a bright star, then zoom out. Um, and the third one is focus on the foreground, for instance, something 30 feet away. So Virginia, I would think that third one, when with your tree picture, might be the the, mm -hmm. the, the right one for you, for you when you're doing that. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so infinity, um, I think everybody knows what the the infinity mark is, um, and what Christine um, taught me was to focus on infinity and back off just a little bit um, in order to. Um, um, make sure that, that that I'm focused on the stars because infinity sometimes is is misleading um, and the infinity mark isn't on a lot of cameras not just it isn't quite per, precise um, so um, I put some facts in here like the near star of the sun it's 94 million miles away well most lenses don't go up to a million miles, let alone 94 million. So um, the um, infinity is, uh, um, and back off a little bit, is going to get you there most of the time. Um, and if, and, and I think this is an um, appropriate setting if you're just going to go with the stars, like if you have your camera pointed straight up into the sky or cutting out all the, the landscape and everything uh, around. Um, because you're not really getting anything close. Everything's very, very far away, unless you're trying to get the moon in, in, in the picture. The... Ask a question? Sure. Uh, hi. <laughs> thanks thanks hey, for Kurt. doing that. Uh, if you have a very wide-angle lens, uh, it always makes the distance appear even further away. Right. Because it's very wide, which would maybe make your stars seem really tiny so if you choose uh, a lens that's not quite as wide say maybe 30 35 would that millimeters would that make the stars a little bit bigger if you're just using this this first focus on infinity technique um yeah it, it, it would um but the, the um focal or your the uh, focal length of, of the, the lens that you use has a different effect, um, even though the the spots might be a little bit bigger. Um, you're also zooming in, and the rotation of the Earth um, is exaggerated as well. Um, and I've got a chart where where I'll try to explain that a little bit more, Deborah. Okay, okay great. Thanks. Sure. The the next one is um, focus on the brightest star. Uh, like zoom in, focus on the brightest star, and then zoom back out. Um, and um, you can achieve that focus usually by um, looking for like the North Star or something along that line um, and zoom in on, on that um, right in, from the middle of your lens and then zoom out to where you want to be. Um, I think this might be... Um, also appropriate for um, just focusing on the stars with nothing in the foreground ground. Um, and um, your lens is not producing a sharp image with another technique. 
So if you're taking pictures with one of the other techniques and it's not um, not working, this might be a technique to um, try to go with. And then the third, um, and I'm sure there's a lot more than three. Um, this is a, a photo my brother took in, um, I don't know, someplace out west, Moab or something. something. And um, I uh, shared the uh, um, Christine slides with him a few years back. And um, he sat in on her, her presentations and he came back with, with this image. So this is one where you would focus on um, something in the foreground, like 30 feet. And um, that way this, the horses are um, in focus and use the circle of confusion um, theory um, to, um, with your, your aperture to get the stars in um, as good a focus as you can. And um, so he did this by light painting the, uh, the horses and um, and uh, creating the the exposure, and this was not a composite. This was a uh, a single single picture. And um, the, so so the, the focal point is the one of the things that I learned. I had have to pay really close attention to. The other one is minimizing camera movement, and to do that. Um, I use a Manfrotto 55. There's all sorts of um, things that are available for um, that are sturdy tripods or sturdy enough tripods um, to use. Uh, this is just the one that I happen to use. Um, and if, uh, um, um, if you keep your camera absolutely still, um, stars become more and more points of light instead of uh, um, the star trails. And meteors are fun, but um, if you catch a meteor while, you're, while your lens is open, um, and aircraft lights are, are really pesky because they uh, um, can really destroy an image. And um, if you're out photographing in some place where there's aircraft in the background, you'll, you'll definitely pick those up. Um, my daughter uses the ground for her tripod and she uses her, her cell phone. And um, in this picture, you'll see the, the uh, um, central column of the tripods fully extended. Um, but I've also learned that when you extend it like that, it decreases the stability of the, uh, the camera. Um, and it's more subject to uh, vibrations and everything. So I, I learned to to crank it all the way down. And, um, and, and that seems to, to help a lot. The other thing uh, people um, I know use is uh, tripod weights. Um, so they've got some sandbags or lead weights that, that they use. Um, I've also found, and I don't wanna carry all that stuff with me. So um, what I um, do is I have all my camera stuff in my camera bag. And my tripod has a, a little hook um, underneath it um, where I can hook my camera bag to and use the camera bag as, as a weight. Um, and that only works if it's not windy out because it's windy, then it's gonna blow the camera bag around. Um, mirrored cameras, um, the, the uh, um, mirrorless cameras are, don't have this problem, but uh, mirrors can cause vibration too. And you you wouldn't think it would cause a lot, but um, it can it can really shake the uh, the camera enough. Um, and there is um, two ways to um, counteract that with mirrored cameras, and it really depends if your camera allows you to do this. The first one is to lock the mirror up uh, in the up position, um, and then begin taking your pictures with the uh, mirrors up once you get it uh, positioned where. Where you, where you want it to be. And I usually try to set it, set it up and leave it in that same position, um, trying different exposures and, and things things along that line while I'm uh, taking pictures. And then I might move it um, depending on if there's other things in the sky that I want to take pictures of. Um, and so a lot of cameras allow you to lock the mirror up if you have a mirrored camera. The other one is, um, and my camera does not have this feature, 
or if it does, I can't figure it out, um, is to activate the mirror action before the shutter opens by a few seconds. So activate the mirror so the mirror will come up uh, like two seconds ahead of it, actually, uh, the shutter opening. And um, that uh, um, gives the camera a chance to calm down um, on, on the shaking. So um, these are the two techniques that, that I've heard people um, look at. And these are longer exposures too. So generally, at least for me, I didn't think that the mirror would cause, cause that much, but I had some uh, um, photos where I can actually notice the, the, the effect of that. And uh, cam uh, cable releases, shutter releases are always good too. Um, that way you're not uh, um, pressing down on the camera with your finger and trying to uh, um, release the shutter and cause a movement that way. Les, have you ever just used the timer on the camera? I, 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 I have not. Um, I tried it that way and it seemed to work pretty well, so. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, maybe I'll try that. I said it, I did it with two seconds and then I also did it with uh, longer ones as well, but the two seconds seemed to work pretty well. Or uh, you're saying a timer to delay it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to see if I can uh, mess with that and see. Thanks. Sure. And then shutter speed. Um, there's all sorts of um, rules and theories people follow. And I, um, so I'll briefly talk about each one of these. And some of them work better for some cameras than other cameras. Um, but the 500, 300, and the MPF rule. So the 500 rule is simply um, 500 divided by the focal length. So you um, divide 500 by, if you're using the 24 millimeter lens by 24, um, and that's the simple um, shutter speed um, um, calculation. Christine um, adds in um, the crop factor. For a full frame, the crop factor is one. But if, uh, depending on your sensor, if it's a APS-C or a micro or one inch, um, and there's other sizes of sensors too, um, that has an effect on how long you wanna leave your, your, your shutter open for. And generally this is, this is uh, where I shoot is the uh, um, 20 seconds um, at, with a 24 millimeter lens. Um, but I've also found a technique that, that I can use for my camera um, where I can do do exposures for 10 seconds um, at, uh, at uh, 24. And that uh, um, seems to work um, as well. So I've gone anywhere from uh, um, 20, um, 10 seconds to 20 seconds to uh, um, try to get my exposures. Um, correctly. Um, so the 500 rule is more geared towards the full frame and Christine actually calculated these, these other um, sensors. So the best way to find out what type of sensor your, your camera have, it has, if you don't know, is look at the uh, user manual um, and usually says in there what uh, your, your sensor is. And, or you can just get onto the, the vendor's um, website and, um, and look up your camera and it'll generally tell you if it's a full frame or uh, what sort of crop sensor it is. Wes? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that you're always going to have your lens wide open, whatever it might be, F4, 2, whatever. But what about ISO? What do you do for an ISO when you're shooting like at 10 seconds at 500 rule? Yeah, um, I'll talk a little bit about ISO um, coming up, but um, the uh, um, I, I guess for myself, what I've done is experiment with it a little bit. And I, I tell people a lot of times that um, these things, these charts and things that I use, um, to help me out. Um, these are a good starting point. Um, and, um, and 
you got to take pictures and look at your your uh, your display and and see that you're actually getting something in, in your display. But I usually shoot around um, 3,200 or 4,000 for my for my ISO. And a lot of it depends where I am. Um, and I got a couple examples that, that, that I'll show too here in a little bit uh, of, of those, those two situations. Thank you. Sure. Um, then the 300 rule, it's the same type of thing, but it's um, more geared towards the crop sensor. And um, I think I have a chart in here someplace with uh, um, with the um, some some more of the settings, but it's the this same type of thing. But instead of dividing um, your uh, five hundred by the the focal length, you just divide three hundred by the focal length, and and they're they're not that far off from, from one another. And if I don't have um, I want to make a note. If I don't have that chart in uh, um, in here, um, I'll email that that out to, to everybody along with Christine's presentation. And the NPF rule, um, the 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 people that are really into astrophotography, um, they they claim that this is um, much more accurate. Um, than um, than the three hundred or the five hundred, and uh, um, and uh, you, you just use this formula. And I, I look at it as I, I don't want to do math in the middle of the night, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with uh, the three hundred or five hundred, and use use my charts. But I wanted to throw this in there in case you hear about that and you wonder what that is. Oh, here's the charts. So the charts are in there. Uh, so this is the uh, modified 500 rule, and this is the modified 300 rule. Um, and um, for, for the, your focal length of your lens, um, and I'll just pick on 24, um, full frame would be 13 seconds, um, whereas a um, crop sensor uh, uh, um, is, is, is a... Um, I guess I got that in there twice, but uh, um, so um, you, you can pick and choose which one that, that you want to use. And after, um, I don't know that I got to spend a lot of time on that. People know what uh, um, after is, I, I assume it's just the size of your uh, lens opening. Um, and um, the, um, I, I think the key for for this, um, Greg, and, and, and you talked about it, you usually shoot with things fairly wide open. However, um, if you've got a fore, foreground object, um, you might want to choose a smaller aperture and leave the lens open a little bit longer um, to uh, to get that the stuff in in the foreground. But then again, you could use the um, your depth of field um, even at the uh, um, wider apertures, um, two, eight, or four, um, and um, and use your depth of field to to focus on the the foreground object and and get the uh, stars in uh, in your depth of field. And then, Greg, you asked about the ISO, um, and what I'm finding um, is I took pictures a um, long time ago using my um, film camera um, and um, definitely didn't know what I was doing back then. Um, but uh, um, I ran into trouble with uh, when, when I, we called it pushing the, your, your ISO um, with, with grain. But what I'm finding with, um, with my uh, digital cameras now is that going up to like the 4,000 ISO or even beyond. I, I shot some at, um, it was around 10,000 or something like that and didn't really get uh, much green at all, um, which uh, was surprising to me. Um, Post-processing, um, I'll talk a little bit about post um, post-processing, um, but 
I, I find post-processing really allows um, me to bring out more of the colors in the Milky Way. I don't add the colors. I just uh, make the uh, Photoshop look for those colors and, and enhance those. Um, and the goal for me is always to get the correct exposure in the camera. Um, but there's always some images that, that need some help. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to um, pull up some pictures and just talk about these a little bit. So um, you can see these uh, palm trees. Um, that's just ambient light. Um, it's in, this was at the end of my driveway. Um, and I just walked out there thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to give this a about the Milky Way. He, he has talked about the Milky Way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, the Milky Way is, it's very, it's not very visible. Um, but, um, this, this picture was taken, um, with a 28 millimeter lens, 10 seconds, F35 at ISO 3200. Um, and that's with all the light pollution around it. Um, now I could use Photoshop to uh, make it a little bit darker. Uh, I could use Photoshop and I got the next picture that I'll show you what, what you can do with it with Photoshop to bring out some, some of the colors. But I, I wouldn't be able to get a, a lot of the colors um, that that I, I could get if I went out to a true dark. And I don't know if you can see this, but you can see some red here and a little red around that, the midsection of the Milky Way, um, barely. Um, or at least I can see that on my screen. So this, this image, um, this was actually taken at um, Big Cypress National Preserve. Um, I don't have anything in the foreground. Um, although there was a palm tree right here that I didn't notice when I was taking the picture. Um, this again was at 28 millimeters for 10 seconds, up 3.5 at uh, ISO 4000. And uh, it, it looks more like a night picture because, because it's there. And you can start seeing more and more of the colors in, 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 the, in the photo. Um, this 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 is the uh, same picture, um, but I used some adjustments in in Photoshop, and I overdid them um, just to to exaggerate them. But um, the uh, um, maybe I can got to move this over here. Um, yeah, I, mean, I would have to uh, bring some other controls up here, but. Um, what I did was add um, more um, white to brighten the stars up, uh, a little bit more red, and some blue to this um, to to get uh, the, the the colors um, to really come out. Um, so um, that's what that's what I'm hoping to uh, um, do a little, little bit more. But um, going from this image, which is an extreme, just for an example, uh, from this image um, is um, really <clears throat> where you need to be. Uh, Wes, which focus method did you use on these images? Um, on all these, I used the um, first one that I talked about, the focus on infinity and back off just a little bit. Because, uh, yeah, on these three images, like even this one, um, the, the palm trees are a little bit um, blurry, but um, I wasn't really trying to get uh, the palm trees in focus because I was just uh, practicing. Um, and um, But if I wanted the palm trees in, in focus, I probably would have focused on 25 or 30 feet. But I, I really haven't done anything like the uh, one picture that uh, I showed you my that my brother took um, out in Moab. He uh, um, um, had had the horses in, in the foreground there. Um, So I've got about two minutes left um, before I get cut off. 
And I wanted to talk about Bortle Sky because a lot of astrophotographers will talk about Bortle. And this is a, a picture from Bortle 1 through Bortle 8. Um, and Big Cypress is two or three, depending on where you are in, in Big Cypress. Um, there are some places in the remote parts of the Everglades that are one. Um, but uh, this just gives you a, an idea of the differences between, between those. Um, so planning for a trip, these are the five things I look for is determine the location I'm going to go to, check the weather and none before I go, um, look at uh, the equipment that I need. Um, I usually get online and look at, at light pollution maps if I haven't been to that place before. And um, safety, um, like we're going out to Big Cypress, and I want to make sure that uh, um, I don't get run over by somebody that's driving through Big Cypress at nighttime. So um, usually my wife comes along and uh, um, sits in the car, and if she sees another car coming, she'll turn on the headlights. That way they, they know we're out there. And... Wes, is there a way to check light pollution? Are there apps for that? Um, I just get online and do a search for um, light pollution map. I, I type in in my Google search light pollution map. 